let me just summarize what I think I tried to cover last time about the malolactic fermentation. May I do this? <laughs> uh, and then um, we can have a little discussion about it if parts of it weren't clear. What seemed uh, interesting to me, I think, was that the very first uh, we knew about malolactic fermentation, about the, uh, the uh, meta metabolism or the pathways, was an indication that it was two steps involved a malic to pyruvate and pyruvate to lactate. And if you remember, the reason for this was mainly based on the fact that NAD was required. And so the reasoning, and that seemed reasonable at the time, was that this must be two reactions. And there are two important questions stem from this. Is what good is this reaction to the lactic acid bacteria themselves, aside from making a uh, change in pH? Now, you could see where this would have a good effect for the changing, to raise the pH of the medium. But this would raise the pH of the medium for all the organisms in there. So there wouldn't be any selective uh, evolutionary advantage for that. So the first question was, what, if any, advantage do these organisms have that have this mechanism? And second, which is related to it, is what is the pathway? What is the, what, how does malic acid get to lactic acid? Does it go through pyruvate, or does it go directly, or through some other steps? And this is important to answer the first question because we couldn't see how it could have any effect on the cell metabolism, at least as far as energetics were concerned. Both from a thermodynamic point of view, there wasn't much energy evolved. And secondly was that there wasn't any way for the cell to apparently to trap this, if, especially if the, if the decarboxylation were a direct decarboxylation. So we, people set out to find if, if there was any advantage to the cell to have this mechanism. And it turned out that in the presence of malic acid, you didn't get much increase in cell yield with malic acid alone or with malic acid plus another bona fide energy source. It was just barely measurable differences in cell yield. So this didn't seem like a very exciting advantage if, if it was a real advantage at all. So, but we did find out that there were some things, some th things happening to the cell in the presence of malic acid. The end products were different, for one thing. It was stimulating the utilization of some, some uh, substrates to give you more uh, lactic acid end product. And even more exciting, we thought, was the stimulation of growth rate, of the initial growth rate brought about by the presence of malic acid. So one of the questions seemed to be, yes, there is indeed something good for the cell to, to have this mechanism. Then the next thing was, well, how, how is it doing it? And we needed to know the, more about the pathway then. Again, as I said, if it was a direct decarboxylation, you would think that you would, couldn't see how this would happen. And yet all the indications were that it, were, it was a direct decarboxylation. The enzyme was purified, didn't seem to be involved, pyruvate at all. The NAD was in there just as a, as a, subst as a uh, coenzyme, the way, say, thiamine pyrophosphate is for um, decarboxylation of pyruvic acid. Well, looking at it closer and more sensitive equipment, we did find that there was a slight amount in cell-free extracts, a slight amount of pyruvate being formed and NADH being formed. And the indications were that in vivo, this was even greater amounts than it was forming in vitro. And I didn't, didn't mention this part, because we didn't have time last time, that we did take some of the purified enzyme that uh, Mickey Schutz had made in, in, in Mainz. It was really kind of funny trying to bring that back here to do the analysis of it to see if we could detect any of this formation of the NADH by the, with a ferometer, that is the spin, spill off of any pyruvate. Um, just as an aside, this enzyme is pretty unstable and so it had to be kept in dry ice. And so that meant I brought it back in dry ice in a thermos bottle and this and with a hole in the top. And I never thought anything about it until I was about ready to get onto the plane. And I thought, hmm, how are they going to see all this smoke coming out of this <laughs> thermos bottle? Maybe this First of all, a bomb, and secondly, then they look further and see this nice white powder. The, the uh, security people let us in, but the customs people might not. The FBI might not let, us, let me in with it, thinking that m that powder was something else, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But there was, there was no problem. <laughs> Got through all right. Anyhow, this, this purified enzyme, which you couldn't detect any pyruvate being formed any other way, did show the same percentage amount of, of uh, reduced NADH being formed by the fluorescent method. So it seems then that the mechanism is this, that there is a slight amount of pyruvate spilling off of this one enzyme in the normal course of the direct decarboxylation. 
And this small amount of pyruvate might be, uh, or is possible, could account for the stimulation of growth because it could act as a hydrogen acceptor either by itself or its conversion to acetyl phosphate uh, and then be a hydrogen acceptor. And we do know that hydrogen acceptors stimulate the growth of, of uh, some of these bacteria. The one thing we haven't really done much investigation on is the role of carbon dioxide. It also stimulates in some cases, and this may have something to do with it. Or it can be converted to acetyl phosphate and, and be be a double hydrogen acceptor. I mean, you can get twice as much hydrogen. Um, the thing that needs to be done then is to correlate these the stimulation of growth with these enzyme activities in various organ, various malolactic bacteria or various lactic acid bacteria or attempt to see if there's any correlation and then want to get some sort of conclusion as to the, the, that this is indeed the mechanism. Well, but I want to talk more about malolactic fermentation as far from the practical point of view, but from this path, biochemical pathway, I think we've covered it, and if there's any questions, we can talk about it now. Can't you measure quantitatively malic acid and then lactic acid to so see if that's true? That's see if it's uh, stereo... Uh, What's the word? Stoichiometric, yeah. Well, the trouble is, you, you're, looking at very, you're looking at two large numbers and trying to see that, that there's a difference. And that kind of arithmetic doesn't work very, out very well. If you're looking for uh, the, a small amount of something, then, you, then you, you can find it. But if you're looking at this large amount, converting to this large amount, uh, there could be a lot of leeway, and you wouldn't be able to pick it up. You wouldn't be able to say whether, in other words, you could say that it's 99 percent perhaps, but that one percent could be really important and you wouldn't be able to tell from the data. So the other way around though, if you're picking up, if you have equipment sensitive to pick up the other part, the other one percent, then you have, then you have a good, uh, good answer and that's what we found. Um, if you're growing uh, this kind of bacteria by glucose mm. free of malate and you added this tiny amount of pyruvate, would you get such a significant increase in growth rate? Say it again. Okay, if you're growing this bacteria yeah, yeah. in a malate free medium, yeah, and then you add, I see. A tiny yeah. amount of pyruvate. Yeah, yeah. The problem, uh, the, the, the paper by Ludi, there's some effects of pyruvate. The problem is what happens in the cell in the cell when you have when you add pyruvate to, to the medium. First of all, you have to be the pH have the pH has to be right so that the pyruvate can get in, and then there's lots of things the pyruvate can go to, lots of competitive things, well, and what so. What about cell-free extract? Well, cell-free extract we found. We found um, pyruvate inhibited the reaction. It inhibited the reaction from malate to pyruvate, which is often true as an end product inhibition, indicating that, that, it, that, it's a, that it was a real, a real effect. But in, in the, see, that's in the cell, the pyruvate wouldn't get a chance to accumulate. We added pyruvate in the cell-free extract and inhibited. Okay. Back to your question. This was an experiment that people tried to do, taking radioactive malic acid and looking for the label and see if they could get radioactive lactic acid. And the, the best experiments that were done, unfortunately, when they didn't have any radioactive L malate, they had DL malate. And they found the, the data ranged everywhere from 85 to 105 percent recovery, um, a theoretical recovery in the lactic acid. So it, it, didn't, it didn't give a good enough answer. Any other questions on this, on the pathways? Yeah. That's it. One of the things, there's more in product form of malic present? Yeah, more. Um, remember the slide I showed where there, you could predict a certain amount of D lactic acid from the amount of glucose that had been added. We got tremendous amounts more. That just doesn't mean that uh, this was a, a mystical <laughs> reaction, but it means that the cell was using other materials. Hmm? That was advantageous to the cell. Well, no, we couldn't say that. We could say something was happening, that there was a definite change in metabolism and presence of malate. And that led us to look at the, at the uh, at the uh, growth rate. No, I, I, that in itself wouldn't necessarily be advantageous, but it meant that something was really happening, that the cell was, it would seem like it might be, but we couldn't say it for so sure. It seemed like the cell was using other materials. The besides thing the, that you found was advantageous is a little bit of pyruvate coming off? No, the thing that we found with that, that was advantageous was the, was the striking stimulation of growth. Sure. Of growth rate, of growth rate, yeah. So this gives us a selected advantage over it, other its neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's been worked on, and it's been worked, and the pathway is known. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, not the pathway, but about the schizosaccharomyces, and I think it's, 
I think it's malate to um, ethanol and CO2. But, but with Saccharomyces, I think it's malate to CO2 and water. But it's done. I just can't remember. Um, we'll come to that. Well, we talked about the three effects, the three um, uh, practical or empirical effects of uh, malolactic. Remember, stability, bringing microbiological stability to the wine, uh, change in acidity, and a change in complexity. And I think now we can add a little, little refinements, little footnotes to some of this, to some of these ideas. Um, we talked about stability. What do we know about the post-malolactic treatment of wine? What, what, how susceptible is it to uh, a, another bacterial fermentation? And what kind of treatment should you do with the wine that has undergone malolactic fermentation? Say that you wanted to encourage it, all the ways we, we talked about, including inoculating with, with ML34, let's say. Now you're chromatographing it, and one day the malic acid is gone from the spot. By the way, is that realistic to say one day the malic acid is, is, is spot is gone? I think it is often. Um, it certainly it is in small lot fermentations, and it is more or less in large lot fermentations. It may, if you have a big tank, it may take a little bit of time, and depends on where you're taking the sample. I think you can get stratification. In Europe, though, it may this the spot disappearing may take may take several days or a couple of weeks. But in, in I think in California generally. You don't you don't take you don't uh, analyze every day anyway, and you you uh, take a sample, and then later on take another sample, and the spot will be gone. By the way, you can you can spot a chromatogram, and not run it and hold it. You, in other words, you could if you can if you have space for ten spots, you got five tanks. You could do a one each, uh, do a spot from each tank uh, every day of the week, and then run them the next the next week, and you'd know when it when it underwent. Is that clear? No, I was saying no. I don't think you want your wine that that warm. But if you're encouraging malolactic fermentation, it would be say around 65. But I, even colder, I think it would go with, within a within a short time. Let's put it that way. Okay, what does this mean when the malic acid spot is gone? Remember, we don't want to look for an increase in lactic acid only, because lactic acid spots can come from other things, from from yeast. But we want to look for disappearance of malic acid. Well. What does this tell us about the bacteria? Does this tell us that the malolactic fermentation is over? Do you, anybody know this? Oh, by the way, let me interrupt. A lot of you people have done a lot of reading on literature reports, hopefully, have done it already, going to turn that in. And there's, a lot of it will touch on the things we're talking about in lecture. And if you've read something about this, uh, tell us about it. OK. Did, did anybody read about uh, uh, the bacterial growth after, after the malic acid is gone? Well, it's just that you're that your bacteria are, are growing, and just like with your yeast, that the, they, cor they don't necessarily get the, the loss, the disappearance of all the sugar doesn't necessarily exactly coincide with the, with the full growth of the yeast. With, uh, with, with yeast, you have lots of sugar yet left by the time the bacteria have grown up, by the time the yeast have grown up. But with malolactic, it's just the opposite, that the malic acid is gone before the yeast have finish their growth. They might be at 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 7th and still go through another decade of growth to 10 to the 8th, let's say. So you might still, bacteria, excuse me, thank you. The, the, that the malic, it depends on the amount of malic acid that's there, but the yeast, uh, pardon me, the bacteria will have generally used up the malic acid before they have come completely through to their growth cycle. So it might be a good technique to wait a couple of days to make sure the bacteria have really grown full and used up any more nutrients that they might be using up, which is one of the things you want them to do to stabilize the wine. Okay, then at that time, what would you do, you think? What would be good practice? Yeah, what else? Yeah, lower the temperature, because you probably had it a little bit elevated. What else might you want to do? Yeah, I think you want to filter, fine and filter. What? Yeah, I think you want to adjust the acidity. Well, I... That's pretty good. I don't think there's any, anything more. <laughs> okay, I think you'd want to lower the temperature if you had had it slightly raised to encourage it. You'd want to um, fine and filter and, 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 and add, add SO2. And you very likely would like to adjust the acidity. You put, might be going to do this anyway, and you wouldn't want to do it until the malolactic fermentation has occurred. Yes. On adjusting the acidity, could you uh, if you filter this pretty fine, 
could you add the maloc as one of your signals now? And oh, that's, that brings up a good point, and we can might as well talk about that now. About what, what acidulating agent would you use? First of all, the, if you did add malic acid, you can get a second disappearance of it very quickly. It goes very, very rapidly. In other words, if, the bac if you haven't gotten rid of the bacteria or cleaned up the wine, I think it would be very dangerous to add malic acid. I think you're just asking for trouble. So that's, uh, that's an acid I would not add. Um, if you wanted to add, if you had low acidity and you wanted to add some acid before the malolactic fermentation, not enough to inhibit it, you might add malic acid then. Uh, anybody else have any other suggestions of, a, of an acid to add? Citric acid. Well, there's something against citric acid. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that today too. You get a lot of, you can possibility of getting end products that um, have a bad character. Any other acidulating agents? Fumaric acid. Well, fumaric acid might be very good because uh, you don't want any, you might add stability uh, to it and it's cheap. It's difficult to get in so, into solution. Yeah, why not? Might be a good one. Any other? So you're leaving one out. Like tartaric acid. Uh, tartaric acid is good. Uh, what's wrong with using tartaric acid? Hmm? Yeah, you're going to. It's more expensive because you 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 lose a lot of it. What's the other the reason? No, that's one thing they don't do. There's a lot of talk in the literature about about tartaric acid being used by bacteria, but I don't know of no case where where you have wine at least less than pH of four, where you're getting any decomposition of tartaric acid by, by uh, any bacteria. This is, I think this is one of the areas of the old literature that is incorrect. There's a lot of it is correct, but this, this is incorrect. Well, what's the biggest problem with tartaric acid? Well, yeah, yeah, that's part of, that's practically what we're saying too, you lose it. What else? Where are you going to get it? It's hard to get now, and it's getting, uh, it's not very expensive, but it's hard to find, strangely enough. Now, maybe that's going to change. It, Nobody's been making it except the, nobody's been recovering it except the Italians, and now there's been a big more demand for, for it, and uh, all of a sudden there's a, a shortage of it. Is now, the price up? No, sir, price apparently, no, the last I heard it wasn't up. Uh, maybe it is now. But of course, this can change again in another vintage. People might start recovering it, yeah. Yeah, you have to use natural. Yes, you have to use natural. Do you know what one that is? Did we go through that already? We did, didn't we? Didn't. But tartaric acid is a natural tartaric acid. Right? We know what it is. Do we know what it is? Hmm? Small L or big L? No. Big L, small d. Yeah. Um, speaking of those, those uh, of the L and D, mal we discussed, mentioned malic acid a minute ago. Okay? If you could get D malic, wouldn't that be groovy? Because there, that wouldn't be metabolized by the bacteria. But is that going to be cheap or expensive? That's the unnatural one. It's going to be very expensive. It has to be made. It's going to be even more expensive than the DL, which is made by organic uh, analysis, which is more expensive than maybe that the natural product from apples, which is the L. <laughs> well, I guess there is something about the stability, about the uh, the. Um, Solubility, but you're going from none after the malolactic fermentation to some. Uh, what about the, do you know about the health? Uh, how about using unnatural uh, acids? Is that legal or allowed? Oh, anybody know? Hmm? Yes, you can. In some case, it depends on the, uh, depends on the acid. d malic is allowed in beverages to be drunk by adults because adults, <laughs> adults have a d malic racemase. But infants don't. And so it's, it's allowed for wine. Uh, oh, well, nobody's going to add D, but you could add DL. And there you would have the danger of adding the L of stimulating a, a malolactic fermentation, perhaps. But the D would be inert. Does, does, a, bacteria, does a bacteria have a, uh, have a racemose? That, uh, no. Not for the malic acid, so no. So the, it would just use all the L and leave the D? Right, yeah. No, we didn't mention succinic acid. Why didn't we? Oh, because I haven't got to that page yet. Yeah, what about succinic acid? I don't know about that, but I think the problem is the expen it's expensive. It's, it's, it's more expensive than, a lot more expensive than fumaric acid. Well, okay, that's the, 
we've, we've talked about adding acid. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have a question about the citric acid. Yeah. Some of the malolactic bacteria decarboxylate citric acid. Yes. Also? Should we take that up now? Okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> what difference does it make? Maybe what's, when's the right time? Oh, <laughs> that's one thing I'm going to ask on the midterm that I'll skip over. Okay, the part that I'm skipping over is so we won't forget it is about uh, deacidification. We're talking about acidification now. We have to come back to talk about deacidification, okay? Well, uh, citric acid can be metabolized, and a lot of end products uh, are found depending upon the organism. And here's one scheme that has been suggested. Well, not only suggested, but... Uh, uh, looked at and found to be true and then we can get acetate over here these are the major products this oxaloacidic can go to pyruvate plus carbon dioxide and the pyruvate can go to lactate of course And the pyruvate can also go to acetate and formate, one of each. And uh, surprisingly enough, acetaldehyde, you don't usually think of that happening in bacteria, uh, plus carbon dioxide, and ethanol. Now these are the major end products, and there's not going to be much problem here as far as your winemaking quality having any of these things being formed, unless you've got too much acetate, let's say. Also, in this scheme, you can get NADH formed, extra NADH, which you don't get with the malic acid. So citric can be used as an energy source, and also it can be used, it also does something else uh, strange. You, get a D, you can get a change in the color of the wine after malolactic fermentation, uh, color change, we'll say. Yeah. Now, with any malolactic fermentation, you can get a color change because there's a change in pH, right? You're increasing the pH, so you're going to get a color change. Now, if you, if you, if you added acid back to the original pH, you think, well, I'll get the same color back. But if you, have cit if you had much citric there in the first place, you don't get exactly the same color change. You get the same color back because you're forming some NADH, which seems to react with the um, pigments and reduces them, uh, uh, bleach, uh, t reduces the color of them, or reduces them and makes them colorless. So citric acid can have this effect. It can, be, it can be an energy source for the bacteria, the ones that use it. It can give you a special color change, not just due to the pH, but because NADH is formed. By the way, you can add NADH to wine and, and get uh, a bleaching of the color. But Somebody mentioned there's something else that can happen in small amounts. We can get acetone and diacetyl formed. Uh, acetone is and diacetyl has the two vicinal carbonyl groups here. Does anybody know about the flavor of this? Butter. Well, yeah, something. <laughs> Rancid butter. Yeah. We'll have, we'll have to bring some into the lab sometimes so you know what it smells like. What about this one? Doesn't seem to have any effect, although some people think it might have some effect in conjunction with other things. Well, this can be formed, we'll talk about the pathway in a minute, especially by Lucanostoc from, from citric acid. It's a big problem in spoilage of orange juice. We have lots of citric acid and you get a lot of diacetyl. Diacetyl you don't like, don't want very much of it. Now originally, or for the last, up to the last five years or 10 years ago, people measured these two together in wine because it was easy or very difficult to measure them separately. So they reported acetone plus diacetyl. And they always found large amounts of it after malolactic fermentation, but they couldn't say which was which, and people thought, well, they're made by the same pathway anyway, so it's a good way to report it. Well, it is true that in spoiled wines, you, you get spoiled, malolactic wines that have undergone malolactic fermentation and are spoiled or often have high concentrations of diacetyl. Well, let's put it the other way. With high concentrations of diacetyl, they don't smell very nice or taste very nice. However, there is this situation where you have about threshold 
levels that seem to, the data is not good on this, but that seem to, um, data aren't good on this, seem to uh, improve the wine, give it more complexity. There, there, is good there is good data on that complexity will increase the, um, the, the quality of the wine at uh, threshold levels. I think you remember Mr. McCrosty's paper with uh, the presented seminar on hydrogen sulfide that at very low sub or threshold levels, the H2S, not identifiable, but the tasters could tell the difference and liked it, liked the wines with it better than without it. The uh, pathway for diacetyl has been worked out, and it, doesn't, it isn't the same pathway as the set of one in uh, lactic acid bacteria. We start with, with pyruvate. which you know can be decarboxylated to um, um, what they used to call um, active acetaldehyde with uh, thiamine pyrophosphate as a coenzyme. And then you would get uh, acid. That's vitamin B1, thiamine pyrophosphate. Now this then can go to acetone. But another pathway worked out by Collins here at Davis, this pyruvate can first go to uh, coenzyme A, or acetyl coenzyme A. And then this can react with another pyruvate plus TPP to give you diacetyl. The interesting thing then, this diacetyl can be reduced to acetone with NADH, but the reverse reaction does not go. So we can see that citrate can bring about, uh, under certain conditions, a large amount of diacetyl formation, which at low levels seems to add to the complexity of the wine, but at high levels uh, where it's noticeable is bad. That step's not reversible. Well, so we've, we've talked about a uh, little more information about stability of wine after malolactic fermentation, the stability that the malolactic fermentation brings about. We've talked about deacidification and some of the problems of, um, of um, adding acidulating agents to bring back the acid that you have lost from the malolactic fermentation, if it's important. And we talked a little bit about complexity, namely about the, the effect of um, citric acid. Yeah. Uh, did you ever say what acidulant we should use? Well, I think tartaric acid is probably the best. Even though it has the disadvantages, it's hard to find. You have to worry about stability, but um, tartrate stability, but you're not at that point yet already. And you're losing a lot because it's going to precipitate out. Well, what's wrong with fumaric? With what? With fumaric, not legally. Yeah, it's legal. Fumaric, you, fumaric is legal. You have to get a permit. Yeah, I think you have to get a permit to use it each time. But it's legal. Um, nothing really, except it hasn't been used very much, I guess. I'm a little bit, just a little bit hesitant about it. So you say tartaric's the best? I would say so. I think it's a question of taste. <laughs> um, but I would say there would be problem. You shouldn't use malic acid, and you shouldn't use citric acid, I would say. Well, you could use iron exchange if you wanted to. I mean, there are reasons for not using that, too, but it would be a way of acidulating. There's another. Um, aspect of complexity that I think is uh, really rather important. That some recent experiments that Mr. O and I have done on some wines from San Joaquin Valley that were very low in acid to begin with. Often these wines have a bad, um, uh, after malolactic fermentation, they don't taste very good. Uh, they're bad wines. And one wonders, is it because of the malolactic fermentation? Is it because of that particular malolactic fermentation? Or is it because of the change in acidity? And we, nobody seemed to know this answer. Or was it, bad, was it because of the bad winemaking practices in some of these areas where they might have had old cooperage that might have had bad bacteria in it or might have had uh, just bad winemaking practices? So we got um, uh, nearly 20 lots of, of uh, grapes from San Joaquin Valley that were especially low in acid. The average acidity, put them all together, there was a range, but the average acidity was 
3.53 and the average pH was 3.85. And the idea was to make lots of wine out of these and to divide each lot into three parts. One part would leave as a control that would get a malolactic fermentation if, if there was to get one, as a spontaneous malolactic fermentation. The second would be we would inoculate with ML34 to try to get a good clean malolactic fermentation. We were already assuming that, that, was, that ML34 would give a clean fermentation, although that's what we're kind of trying to prove out. It prove is it the grapes or the bacteria that's the culprit in this case. And the third thing we would do what? We'd prevent the malolactic fermentation by adding fumaric acid. And these, this experiment went on last year. Uh, the controls, almost all of them underwent malolactic fermentation, uh, spontaneous malolactic fermentation. The ones in which we added ML34 all did, but usually faster. And none of those with fumarate underwent malolactic fermentation. And the, tasting, the taste scores, I think, are rather interesting. You can imagine these aren't the best wines in the world to begin with, with this um, starting material. But the controls, the average taste score on the basis of 20 was 11.99. Those with ML34 was significant, was higher, not great, but significant, statistically significant. And then that with fumaric acid, which of course not only is preventing the malolactic fermentation, but is increasing the acidity too, so you're getting two uh, two shots of uh, increased quality here, 13.05. And we're, I think it was really a good experiment. We, I think we got a lot of good information that you can, well, if you prevent the malolactic fermentation in these grapes, you, these wines, you're probably doing the best thing you can, not only because you're preventing a bad malolactic fermentation perhaps, but because you're increasing the acidity. And the other thing is that it is, there is a difference between, uh, between bacteria. Uh, ML34 does seem to be uh, preferred to other organisms. Well, okay, <laughs> I'll tell you why. Um, fumaric acid is a is a natural compound. Yeah, there's difficulty, and it's cheap. It's difficult to get it into solution in wine. It goes well in grape juice, but you can't use it in grape juice because the yeast metabolizes it. Um, uh, you can, it will solubilize, but it's slow in solubilization. But the, the things that are, that are, make one a little bit hesitant are two things. One is that Radler and Mainz has shown that different bacteria have different sensitivities to fumaric acid. And even though we have never found a case where fumaric acid did not inhibit malolactic fermentation, it's possible that when you're taking your chances by using additives to solve some microbiological problems, you may be getting into trouble because you may have an organism that is resistant to fumaric acid. And the other thing, which is uh, you just have to think about, that the work has been done to show that the fumaric acid mechanism of action at the pH of wine is that it kills the bacteria. And you wonder about that. Uh, it's a natural compound. It's in all our cells. But still, how does it kill the bacteria? One makes you just a little bit hesitant. But again, people are using it. It's legal. Uh, fumaric acid is used as a acidulating agent in many, many foods um, where, without alcohol, where it goes into a solution very easily. And it's uh, cheap. And as I say, it's a natural compound. I can't imagine any harm from it. But uh, uh, I think it's just, as I mentioned already, it hasn't been used very much yet. And I think each year that it's used more, the, more, the less hesitant one might be in, in recommending it. Matter of fact, I less hesitant this year than I was last year. Yes. No, I think you put it in the put it in the wine and um, stir it occasionally. There is a, a formulation now that is um, uh, more easily solubilized, more quickly solubilized. I forget what it's called, but you the best to use that. I guess it's finer ground or something like that. It takes maybe a day sometimes in, in a large tank to get it completely dissolved. No, no, that's no. There's no problem there. They just chew it up in a hurry. By the way, the the end product, most of the end product from the fumarate has been pretty well worked out too. Dr. Poloni found that fumarate.
goes to malate, even though there is very little fumarase in these cells, but there's enough to convert it to malate, then it goes to the malolactic fermentation. When it is, oh, you say, well, how can it do that? That's the point. If you're using very, very low levels of fumarate, the, ye the bacteria is not inhibited and will metabolize the fumarate. You have to get up to levels that are still not very high, uh, 0.05 to 0.1% to get inhibition. If you're getting too low, or if you're at a uh, high pH, not pH of wine, the bacteria will utilize the fumarate. You're talking about an excessive malolactic and what it involves. Uh, excessive? Yeah, we're always being told about it, excessive malolactic. Oh, um, I think all that means is that if the malolactic fermentation is occurring right then, or is going rather rapidly, you may get accumulation of some end products, perhaps a little bit of H2S that's not very pleasant. I think we talked about this, that you, should, you shouldn't bottle wine for a couple of months after malolactic fermentation, because very often there is some um, bad effects of the malolactic fermentation that go away, some, odd, uh, some off products being formed. And if, you're, if you have a rapid malolactic fermentation, if you do a, add a big bacterial inoculum, then this is going to be pretty evident. Or if you're right in the middle of it, it's going to be pretty evident. Yes? Lactic acid produces, you know, well, it's semi-volatile, I guess, but can you smell like the sauerkraut? No, uh, that's, a, that's a one we, I had it listed. We should have mentioned lactic acid, uh, which is cheap in the impure form, and why not use it? Uh, a lot of people talk about the lactic acid odor that they don't like. When they're talking about malolactic, they mean the sauerkraut um, diacetyl odor. But that doesn't come from lactic acid itself. Pure lactic acid doesn't have that. As a matter of fact, pure lactic acid is a solid. But what you get ordinarily is a commercial product is about 70%, and it's liquid. It is slightly volatile. Uh, people have suggested that maybe the volatile acidity that occurs from malolactic fermentation is due in part from lactic acid rather than acetic acid. That's not true. It's mostly from acetic acid. But it, uh, according to uh, Mrs. Pangborn and um, another paper here, people, tasters cannot tell the difference between these acids, uh, except for the amount of acidity. And if you, if you know the pKa's and the, uh, just the TA's, then they can't tell the difference. Yeah, Jed. If, uh Stabilized your wine, uh, the, yeah. uh, the that's a good, I don't know. Uh, we have to get into that. I don't mean in the course, but we've got to find out about this geranial and whether it, or not, oh, it's not geranial, but this geranium-like character, where it comes from, what it has, what, if anything, bacteria have to do with it. I don't know. We may have some experiments done before the course is over that we can give you an answer on that. People can't differentiate between the taste of all the acids you've mentioned. That's according to the literature. Well, they must be able to acetic acid. Yeah, the acetic, yeah, acetic acid, which is very, very volatile. That's different. But I meant these, the fixed acids in, in wine. Tartrate, malate, um, lactate. And I can't, I've done it myself, and I can't tell what yeah. So what's wrong with lactate? Oh, I'm not sure that anything is wrong with it. I don't know anybody, but anybody that's using it. I think it has a bad name because people talk about lactic sour. Um, Okay, one more question, John. Um, were these wines all dry or the ones? Here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With this, there wasn't much, it wasn't much, oh, I see, you think maybe the sugars were so high. No, they were all dry. Yeah. Well, uh, the idea that the acid, uh, you know, acid there isn't any real difference in the taste, so our old friend from Germany, Dr. Munch, this was quite yeah. despite how we're saying it. I think you have to watch out for your cations. That's true. But I'd like to see tasting panel data. It's a, usually, you know, it's this morning I tasted it type, type of information. Well, let's go on. There's two things. There are some, I mentioned some secondary effects of malolactic fermentation. One was this change in pH that occurs because of, of a a change in color because of the change in pH. Another is that you can get a, um, a change in the amount of, of um, cations like iron and copper in the wine from malolactic fermentation. Can you guess how that might occur? Yeah, you have chelation powers of both malate and citrate, especially citrate acid, but malic acid too will chelate copper and iron. So if you metabolize these, you have raised, in a sense, the amount of free copper and iron, and this is, can be a problem. What do, you have to, what, what do you have to do about it, do you know? You have to do something, get rid of it, yeah. 
get rid of them because you might get some oxidations or some, some protein haze. Another thing is that you can change the, change the stability of the tartaric acid uh, by, because of the change in pH. The bitartrate, um, bitartrate is pr pretty insoluble. And uh, if you're already at the solubility level and it's all precipitated out, now if you, and you're at a rather low pH, and now if you increase the pH up to that magic number, I think it's 3.56, is that right? For the pKa between the, the two forms of, bitart of tartrate, you're making more bitartrate. And so you're, you're un the wine's becoming unstable now. If you've gone from a low P lower pH up to here, you're forcing more tartaric acid into the bitartrate form. And if it were already s saturated, now you've added, uh, you've added instability problems again. Uh, I keep a reading, reading assignment last time, one page, in uh, the review number one, my review on malolactic. Is that right? Page two second, uh, 269 on secondary effects of, um, of the malolactic fermentation. We'll read that and we'll go into that. Well, we have time to talk about way, other ways of deacidifying wine, which doesn't seem like a very important um, aspect of, of uh, malolactic fermentation, I mean an alternative to malolactic fermentation for us because we have wines that are so low in acid to begin with that it doesn't seem important. Yet there are reasons to think that this may change. I think I mentioned these before. The idea of using new varieties in, new varieties in certain areas and going to colder areas and going to index free, uh, uh, virus-free uh, stocks that seem to mature better. And we may be getting situations, hopefully, that we have wines with too much acid. And how can we get rid of this acid? One of the ways is the malolactic fermentation. We've already said this may be difficult because, you, because of the capriciousness of the malolactic fermentation, that in these cases where you actually want it to deacidify, rather than stability or complexity, these are the very cases where you're going to have difficulty in getting the malolactic fermentation to go because the pH is going to be so low to begin with. Well, there are a couple of other methods that have been tried uh, and used in some cases. And one is the one that Jed suggested using the Schizosaccharomyces uh, yeast. Now, these are the fission yeast. Some of, many of these are alcohol tolerant and they can carry a fermentation clear to dryness. And most of them ferment malic acid very, red, very rapidly. And so a lot of people had the idea, or some people have had the idea, of using them for this purpose, to deacidify the wine by getting rid of the malic acid, not going to lactic in this case, but going all the way, get, so there's no acid left from the malic. Uh, I think it's ethanol and um, ethanol carbon dioxide, but I'm not, that's in the literature, but I, I can't recall right at the moment. Um, what was, did anybody know the disadvantages, why this didn't work out very well at first? Yeah, the thing is, these aren't wine, gen generally thought of as wine yeast, and they gave a lot of bad products, including H2S. But um, Dr. Benda then in Würzburg made a big survey of a lots, lots of these Schizosaccharomyces, got them from all over the world, and she found a few that didn't give any off flavors. And since then, she's really been hot on this idea of, of um, using these yeasts to ferment the, the grape must. Now, there's a problem, problems here of needing somebody that has a little savvy for microbiology. It's not the kind of thing that, that lots of winemakers could handle very easily. Another problem is if you have wines like, uh, grape juices like these with very high acid, they're going to have lots and lots of malic acid, maybe as much as tartaric acid, and in the European situation, more than the tartaric acid. So you're going to deacidify this. You're really deacidifying it. You're losing half of your acid. It's not just going to, to lack, I mean, uh, with the malolactic fermentation, you're losing one half of the malic acid. But here you're losing all of the malic acid. So you may go too far. Indeed, I tasted some wines that have been made this way, and they were very high in pH at the end of the alcoholic fermentation, and they spoiled. They were really pretty bad. But on the other hand, I've tasted some, and we've made some here, that are quite good. Now, the way to handle this might be to do it this way. Take part of the must and, and ferment it with the Schizosaccharomyces and get rid of all the malic acid and other, the rest of the must with uh, regular, uh, say, Montrachet, and then blend these wines together to get the final pH or uh, acidity that you want. Um, 
there, it has some disadvantages in the complexity of doing it, uh, that it's a very complicated type of, type of wine production. But on the other hand, it doesn't have any other, other disadvantages in, in, well, as we'll see when we talk about uh, the acidics in a minute. Yeah. Which, which ones of the yeast were the ideal as far as the oh, they were, the Yeah, they were just they were strain numbers. She just picked them. They were, um, mm, they weren't species pombi. They were uh, malifrodens, I think. Uh, I'm not really sure which species they were. As a matter of fact, I don't know. I don't think in all cases she keyed them out. Yeah. Well, no, no, they, no, they fine. They, they're very tolerant to alcohol. Oh. Yes, you'd have to, yes, they don't grow as fast as, say, Montrachet, and so you have, to, you have to think about using large inoculum and maybe clarifying your, wine, your grape juice quite a bit at the beginning so that you uh, don't have a lot of wild yeast there. They're SO2 tolerant, too, much as, uh, as Montrachet. One more question, I think our time is up. Yeah. Okay, how, how do these pseudosaccharomyces fermented wines compare with saccharomyces fermented wines? Oh, the ones we made here <laughs> uh, were never quite as good as uh, they were a little bit, a little down in the scoring with the, um, with the taste panel. But we never had the situation where we had very, very high acid grape juice to work with either. So it really wasn't quite fair. We were looking, actually what we're trying to do is see just how bad the off flavors were. And they aren't, they aren't very bad. We have two strains of hers that uh, seem to be pretty good, but they, they just uh, weren't quite as good as Montrachet. Well, there's, Time is up. I think we can, we can discuss. Uh, we'll have a little lab lecture, and we can uh, tie up any loose ends. Then, uh, be a lab this afternoon and lab this evening.